Here we go. Oh. So today, hi, we're today we're here with Terry McBride and we're he is a musician songwriter. We've got some questions for for you. You ready to go? Okay, Judy, I'm prepared. Or maybe we'll see if I'm prepared. <laughs> we'll see. Well, first of all, let's talk about your new soon to be released album Rebels and Angels. Tell us a little about that. Well, it's uh, I guess it's been about 20 years in the making, or I guess it could have been 40 years in the making. It's my first solo album ever. I, uh, I, re I released a little EP a couple years ago, five songs on that. That was my first attempt at sort of coming back and getting involved into the recording as an artist side of things. I had been behind the scenes for, uh, oh, since about 1995, I'd been behind the scenes writing songs for other artists, which was a great life if you can, if you can get there. It's, uh, it was a great way to, to uh, still be creative, still travel, still be involved, but just not in the spotlight. So it's been interesting all these years later, here I am still getting opportunities. So that feels good to say the least. And I'm excited about it. Got to work with some great people. My producer for starters, Luke Laird, who I've known for almost 20 years. He was just a young guy, just got out of college. And now he just celebrated his 24th number one song as a songwriter. So he's had a pretty amazing career. And uh, I tried to take credit for some of it, but I have nothing to do with it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that alone was fun. He sort of jumped in through writing a couple songs that led to an album. We didn't really have any plan. It just the music sort of led us to the direction. And that was a great way to go, you know. Yeah, how do you choose the songs? like this particular, your first album, how do you choose the songs for an album like this? Well, uh, it came in, in a couple different ways, really. A couple of the songs chose us because <laughs> we, <laughs> were, we were writing some good stuff, you know, so we wanted to include that. And uh, once we agreed or thought this could be a record, an album, uh, then we just kept writing and songs seemed to fit the direction we had already established with the first couple songs. So. Then I submitted a few things that I liked to Luke since he was the producer now. And uh, I had a song that I'd written a few years back with Chris Stapleton that I always liked. And it didn't have a chance in hell of ever getting recorded because one, it was a waltz. So uh, that's not <laughs> really high on the list of getting cuts right now. And it was really country and classic sort of, but the story is I was listening down one day, I'd listened to it several times because I liked the song, and Chris Stapleton was singing our work tape, which uh, we probably wrote that right here at this little house. And uh, his work tapes are so amazing that we've, I've had a few cuts from just the work tapes because he sings so dang good, you know? So I liked yeah. it, but this particular day I could tell lyric, lyrically, the song was leaning in a direction where it could be a duet, you know, uh, with what it was saying. It was called Rebels and Angels is the title cut of the album. And so I just got on a mission to try and get one of my favorite singers, female thing, singers of all times, Patty Loveless. I reached out to my old producer, Tony Brown, who used to produce Patty's records. And I've known Patty. We toured together. I've just been a huge fan. Reached out to her. She responded immediately, sent her the song. She loved it. And she told me, she goes, you know, Terry, last year I sang on Bob Seger's album. And this year I'm going to sing on your album. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, so, so I thought we're off to a good start. You know, that, that kind of was the centerpiece of the album. And then we just built around that really. Wow. So how old were you when you wrote your first song? Gosh, Judy, I was probably, you know, experimenting always with music growing up from the age of about nine. That's mm -hmm. when I got my first guitar. My dad was a, a really good musician, accomplished singer, songwriter, arranger. We had a studio, recording studio. So I wanted to be just like my dad, you know, so I tried to do everything he did. In the beginning, it was sappy, like love <laughs> songs. Oh, so horrible, uh, you know, thinking I knew. But even at a young age, I was drawn to those, you know, drinking, cheating, heartbreaking songs and I had never done any of that yet I, want, I wanted to do all of it you know but uh, I told people Willie Nelson was one of my huge influences growing up especially songwriting he was so a master at crafting a song and he was just brilliant at it and Phases and Stages was an album I loved as a young teenager and it was actually a concept album a divorce album 
all the songs are sad. All of them are just lonely and <laughs> heartbroken. And I just, I couldn't wait to be just like that. You know, I just, I loved every single inch of it. So I'm sure I was trying to write those types of tunes without even knowing what I was doing. Then I spent a big portion of my young life wanting to be a great musician. I set my sights on thinking, oh, that'll get me where I'm going, you know? And then finally realized I've got to create some music if I'm going to be anything other than just a bass player in a band, you know? I, I could sing, but I really wanted to do more than that. And then I finally got with some really good songwriters in Austin, Texas, who were having success with artists like Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, the fabulous <laughs> Thunderbird. Yeah, great artists that I really looked up to and admired. And then um, it, was a guy, it was a guy named Bill Carter and his wife, Ruth Ellsworth. And I was playing with Delbert McClinton at the time. And I, and I left Delbert's band after two years. I love Delbert so much. And Delbert's on my new album. Actually, I have a duet with him. But uh, I, just, I just knew if I was going to do something, I had to leave that cushy, good, drunken job that I had. And I had to clean <laughs> myself up. And I did. I met Bill and Ruth because Bill was putting a band together to go out on the road to Stevie Ray Vaughan. So audition got the got the bass gig we hit the road toured with stevie all the way to new york city back off and it was just so amazing and stevie was at the very top of his game this was about 1987 mm -hmm. uh 88 and uh wow. it was a wonderful experience and so i played bill and ruth some of my little home demos they really liked it and then we set out to write songs and they elevated my writing they were like a songwriting team and that eventually led us to Nashville. And that's how I ended up getting signed to MCA, really through those songs and through that meeting, chance meeting with, with Bill and Ruth. Wow, that's an amazing story, that the talented guy. Uh, you know, so did you ever experience that, uh, no, you're not that good when you came to Nashville? <laughs> oh yeah, at the beginning it was so intimidating. It was, I would go home and I was driving from Texas to Nashville, that's a long, a long drive to lick your wounds all the way back to Texas. And it was, it was depressing. I, I thought it's, it might as well have been uh, trying to get to Mars. You know, it just did not seem obtainable at all. And, uh, you know, even the, uh, even the uh, person who was working at the door when I would finally get to a publishing company, I'd go inside and whoever was answering the phone or whatever, they were intimidating. You know, they're like, we don't take any unsolicited material and I didn't even know what that was in the beginning. What is unsolicited material? I had to go find out, you know? And so it was a struggle. Nobody, I hadn't done anything and nobody wants to do anything with someone who hasn't done anything, you know? So uh, eventually once my songs got better and my, the, the songs were better, I was singing even better. It was, it was just better. We, it was elevated to a different level. Then some doors opened really quick, quickly or certainly quicker than they were prior to that, which every door was pretty much slammed in my face. So it wasn't easy. It's one of those things you have to want it bad. It's just rejection after rejection. And everybody who's anybody has been through it. I mean, there are a few cases of maybe somebody came to town and got a deal, but for the most part, you just got to work at it and want it more than anything. With all that said, do you have any advice for up and new and upcoming songwriters? Well, yeah, I mean, there again, it's just something you have to work at it. And it's for me, I didn't really have a backup plan. So I just had to keep going at it. I had, I didn't have uh, education. I didn't have school. I didn't have a second job. I was a working, struggling musician. And uh, I had to try and just keep at it, you know, until I, I, I could have gone and gotten to a point where I would have given up, I'm sure, because I was getting to my late twenties and uh, all of my other friends had gone to college and had a job and a profession. I was still struggling in a hand-me-down car for my father-in-law. It was not pretty or glamorous by any means. And the music business in the beginning is not glamorous. There's no crowd. There's no money. And it's just something you have to want. It's something you have to love. And I still do all these years later here with you, Judy. You know, I still enjoy this process. I still like getting up and meeting new people, writing songs. And you got to have a little bit of that spirit in you to get you through the down times, you know, music has to kind of save you at times just to kind of lift your spirits if nothing else. But I'd say just practice, work at it, keep at it, surround yourself with as many talented people as you can find. That was the key to some of my success. It didn't hurt that I spent 13 years on the road with Brooks and Dunn, you know, I had some pretty accomplished singer songwriters there that I could share ideas with. So 
in the beginning that doesn't happen but even if you're the local level if you can just you know find someone or get in front of someone whether it's a tiny venue whatever just a way to experiment and practice what you think you want to do it's uh you know you're going to stumble and you're going to fall and you just got to you just got to keep at it and uh open your ears up to all the good stuff that you like singers and songwriters do you admire really you know dissect what they're doing and saying and see if you can't you know say something in that sort of clever well crafted way you know i think as i got older i was just able to judge the stuff that wasn't going to work and lines that weren't good and i was able to edit and and uh, myself really you know that was something that i grew into because in the beginning you love everything you do you know oh this is great my songs are great then you go to nashville and go well, they weren't as good as i thought they were you know but um just keep at it you have to that's great advice um how was it to work with uh brooks and dunn and reba <laughs> well I tell you, for me, Judy, I'm a fan of music. That's where it started for me, early age, played in bands all through high school. So we were just constantly learning new songs, our favorite songs by our favorite artists, you know, and then getting a chance to go see them, you know. And so yeah. Brooks and Dunn and Reba, you know, those are pretty classic, iconic artists. And uh, I loved them, both of them, and respected them way before I ever had a song recorded by them. And um, actually got to know Kix Brooks first because <laughs> Kix co-wrote a song that my band, McBride and the Ride, had a, a number one song with in 92 called Sacred Ground. He and mm -hmm. Vernon Rust co-wrote that song. I loved it. And I actually met Kix at the number one party, which is a pretty good way to meet a guy if you're going to meet somebody. He was, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, was a, exactly. it was a pretty high five moment there. And so <laughs> we hit it off right away. Then in 92, McBride and the Ride, Diamond Rio, and Brooks and Dunn, we were nominated for uh, New Group of the Year, the ACMs, back when they had them in Los Angeles back then, if you remember. And oh, so yeah. we all went, out to, all went yeah. out to LA. You bet. You remember those days. They were so yeah. much fun. And so we went out to LA, and uh, Ronnie actually stepped out of the elevator with his wife, and he went, dang, Terry McBride, you know, and I was shocked he knew who I was. And oh, man. They were awesome. fans. Oh, it was great. They were fans of mine, and I was... You know, Neon Moon is just one of the best songs ever. Ever. Ronnie, Ronnie wrote that by himself. And of course, his vocals, he's just so brilliant. Mm -hmm. every, mm -hmm. every line in that song is just so well written. The words of every sad song seem to say what I think. Well, all those S's, that's just like brilliant, you know? <laughs> Way more going on in that line than you even think. You know, that's just, that's clever, clever, well-written stuff. So anyway... When Ronnie and I finally met, they recorded a song of mine in 96 called I Am That Man. And it went on wow. to be a hit from that album. And Ronnie invited me over to the house and we just hit it off. We're like old high school buddies, you know? And he said, cool. I've got a, I got a bus. I'm getting a bus. I'm, I'm getting out of the band bus. I got my own bus. Come go with me, you know? And so I did. And we went wow. to California. We, we headed out to the West Coast for 15 days and we wrote 10 songs on that trip oh, and uh, awesome. that, that led, to, well, it led to me being on the bus for 13 years. Ronnie's like, man, I had no idea it was going to be like this and it would be so good. And from now on, when the bus rolls, just be on it, you know? And so I, I did, and we just uh, continued to have success all along the way and great relationship. I still talk to Ronnie all the time. Still okay. kicks every now and then, but Ronnie's really been good about staying in touch and I can see, probably going to end up doing something with Ronnie in the future. He's working on a project right now that could include several of our older songs, real country honky-tonk type things that we wrote. So nice. anyway, there's some good stuff coming up for him too, and then maybe me and a chance for us to continue working together, which would be great. Oh, but, we look forward to keeping... That, yeah. We yeah, look forward to that. Aside from that, to Reba as well, you know, just such a fan of Reba. And then to have her involved, I wrote... Uh, if you see him, if you see her, the duet. And uh, mm. so that was, the, that was the first time I got to really kind of be hands-on. They were out on tour with Reba, so I did get to hang with her a little bit and everybody in her team and crew and band. And, but then after that song, we really got to know each other. Then she went on to be part of Cowgirls Don't Cry, which Ronnie and oh, I wrote. Yeah. And she really, we sent her that song like four in the morning when we wrote <laughs> it because we wrote it with her in mind. She was our inspiration as the little cowgirl, you know? 
And then uh, she loved it until Ronnie, I want to record this. Ronnie went, I want to record it, you know? So they came together and found a way to do it together. And then um, it, the, that whole process of Cowgirls Don't Cry was wonderful. My, my little redhead is in the video and Ronnie's little redhead plays Reba. Oh. My little redhead plays her at five. She's now 18, but wow. they were so cute. They were both redheads and the, the little video was so sweet. And then uh, <laughs> of course having the original redhead Reba was a, just a blast. And it was just like a dream come true. That song, everything about it just kind of worked and came together. And Reba was a big part of that. Wow. Thank you for that. That's pretty awesome but, for all of us Reba yeah, was, and Brooks and Dunn fans. Well, well, me too. Even as just a songwriter and a fan, that's just a great moment. You know, a lot of things almost come together. A lot of things fall apart. But when that finally mm -hmm. did happen, it was like, dang it, this is so good, you know. And they made it that way. Just a combination of Reba singing that sad little last verse as the dad passes away in that song. Um, yeah. People just loved it. I get so many comments and cowgirls and horse people and whatever you know yeah it just they connect and that's when i know i've done a decent job of writing is is the response i get from these people and how it touched them and that's just a great thing yeah it's a great song so oh, what have you been doing during this uh, pandemic for your career well i tell you as as strange as it is and has been this album release project has been great for me it's, uh, you know, my touring went away completely. I, I toured about 40 dates last year, just acoustic solo, singer, songwriter, 90 minute show, just me and my guitar. And it was really good. Met so many people, great venues, some great crowds, some small crowds, some big crowds. It was a mixed bag, but just a good experience. So without that, you know, I have started writing again. I have some close friends couple of young artists that I'm working with. So that's been nice, but I've done a lot of Zoom co-writing too, which has been strange, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. there's a young artist, uh, Haley Witters. Have you heard of her yet, Judy? No. She's, oh, look her she's, up. A, one, she's a wonderful young artist from Iowa and uh, she just got signed to Craig Wiseman's label, uh, Big Loud, <laughs> loud, loud Music. I, I love her music, very genuine, very honest singer and writer, great ideas. And uh, I had to meet her over Zoom like this, me and you, and then we had to co-write, you know, with well, another writer, third, and the, the whole, you know, Brady Bunch looked on yeah. these boxes, but it was a, yeah. it was a very impersonal, and per, you know, it was, it was just different. And we had a bad connection that day, so it was glitching. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, it took, yeah, it was, it bless her heart. She hung in there. We wrote a really good song <laughs> and I wrote with her again the second time on, I'm, I can't wait to ride with her in person. It's just like, oh. I've loved meeting her and getting to know her, but I'll, I'm certainly looking forward to, to being in a room with her, you know? Yeah. But uh, so, so to answer your question, I've been working on this record. We've been filming a lot of stuff behind the scenes that's going to come out as part of it. I did a uh, three sort of unplugged performances at a beautiful studio here called The Castle. It wow. looks like a castle. It's an old, old home that Al Capone once owned as wow. a hideaway when he would leave Chicago. It has amazing history. And it's also wow. been the home to hundreds of hit records. Every Alan Jackson hit ever recorded was recorded there. And uh, as well as Miley Cyrus uses it. It's a, it's a fantastic studio. So we filmed three of those. Uh, we also did a sit down and filmed a Q&A with my producer uh, Luke Laird. And uh, so we've just been busy. We've been doing that. I hired a little team of some young, brilliant people to try to make me look and sound good. And uh, <laughs> and so it's been a work in, pro in, in, in progress. And, and so uh, it's been good. It's occupied my time during this downtime. Oh, wow. That's great. That's, that's a good way to do it. Do you happen to have a favorite yeah. song from the new release soon to come? Well, I think just the whole, you know, awe factor of Patty Loveless, that song would have to be one of my favorites just because it just worked out. I love things that are ideas and then they come to fruition, you know, like I said, in this business, it doesn't always happen. Uh, she has been asked to do a lot of things. Sometimes she doesn't like <coughs> the song. The song is the right for her and she might pass, you know, I mean, which is anybody's, uh, you know, that's up to them how they, decide what they're going to do. So I just, I'm just thrilled that 
She's part of the record. It's something I talk about often because I'm just such a fan <laughs> of Patty. One of the very first tours I did as McBride and the Ride was in 1991. And we went to Canada and we opened for uh, the Desert Rose Band and Patty Loveless and McBride and the Ride. So I'd already known Patty as a fan, you know, but then I got to know her personally, just, just loved her as a person as well. And I've uh, continued to run into her. We were both on MCA at the time. And so uh, it was a, you know, it was a lot of seeing each other over the years, but this has really connected us in a way that we never had been before. And so I, just excited about that, excited for people to hear it, really. That's uh, the thrill of getting to do something like this, getting to share it. Wow. Oh, I can't wait for it. That's going to be in September? Is that when it's due uh, to be released? That's, yeah, that second, that's going to be the second streaming or single that we'll release. Single. Okay. Yeah, and then the album will come October, like, 21st, I believe. But oh, great. Yeah, that, that, that single will come mid-September. We'll start promoting it, and you'll see it, and we'll, get, we'll make sure you get a copy of whatever you want. And we'll talk more about it then. Um, cool. You know, when you have when it's more released, we'll have another interview with you after it's come out. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so I was wondering. I always ask during this pandemic, do you happen to have your mask handy so you can put your mask on? Oh, oh I have them everywhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get mine. <laughs> oh, you got yours. <laughs> no, we usually we usually ask everybody to put their mask on so we can have it. So we so here's mine. Oh, oh, let me see. What does it say? Oh my gosh, you got it. Quarantine 2020. So that Goofy's my oh, favorite Disney character. So I had to get that oh, one. Oh, that's myself. cool. Oh, I don't have anything that clever. Mine's basic, like black, or I have the surgical looking ones. Those are in my truck. I have a oh, whole yeah. box of those. You know, we, we, we wore the mask early on. I have children at that time. My old, my youngest daughter was still living with us. She just moved into an apartment, but you know, we, we were very uh, concerned about it and it just uh, yeah. felt like the thing to do. You know, I just, oh, right. the main thing with me is I haven't been tested, so I don't know. The last thing I want to do is give it to someone else, you know? Yeah. I just, uh, yeah. I canceled all my dates. I had dates in Texas and they were still wanting me to come do it. I said, you know, that would weigh too heavy on me. If someone came and unfortunately got sick just because I'm out trying to play a show somewhere, yeah. I don't know if I could live with that and I wouldn't want to. So it was just an easier, an easy decision for me to go, I'll just wait. Let's just see how this plays out. And when it feels better, because again, my fans, they range in all ages, they're young and they're older and they like the whole experience of coming and visiting and signing and hugging and, it, I just feel like I'm cutting them short, you know, Hey, I'm going to come, but don't get near me. And yeah. I don't know how I would pull that off. It just didn't feel right to me. So we'll just put it off for now. And I think it'd be a lot more fun for everybody once we're back to something that resembled what we used to know as far as the touring. Yeah. Cause right now what's happening down in Texas, it starts off kind of structured and there's a little, distance and then after a few cocktails it all turns to whatever you know there's no mm -hmm. distancing there's no con one in control backstage yeah. or out front it just turns into whatever and that just yeah. doesn't sound good to me at the moment at all yeah that's that's the best advice you could give right there because we all have to do our share and i have a 92 yeah. year old father who's going to be 92 oh. this month oh. and uh he and I had to get tested about a month ago, and that was so nerve-wracking, just waiting to hear, because he was exposed yeah. to my, my nephew had it and was with him uh, for wow. a few hours in the car. So, but luckily, oh, neither no. of us had it, but it was very wow. and stressful to go through, you know? Yes, that is. I can only imagine, and your dad being 92, that's a real concern, you know? Yeah. I mean, you us, know. even in our 60s, we're, 60s still in, yeah. we're still in good shape, but I don't <laughs> think it doesn't matter, really, you yeah. know what I mean? Depending yeah. on what strain of you you get, that's the scary part of it for me. Right. And I'm not, I don't live in fear. I'm still doing, going and, you know, I'm, I, here we are. You know, we found a way to continue moving forward, but right. I am a little cautious and I, I want to think about my family and, and those around me. You know, I just, yeah. I just, I hate this to become an issue of whether you wear it or not. I see early on I was wearing it. I felt like the odd man out. I'd get stares at, Home yeah. Depot or wherever I went, and people looking at me, you know, a couple of rednecks, you know, not digging <laughs> what I was doing. I went, dang, but it's just what I felt was the thing to do, you know? 
Yeah. Well, at least, you know, with you, it's great because you can write and hey, yeah. maybe you can do little videos to show, share with uh, all of us fans uh, through Zoom, you know, and that's, 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 that's great. That. At least we still have a connection with, with you and your music. Well, you're right. I, I did a lot of the streaming stuff early on, you know, yeah. uh, trying and, and it was fun in the beginning that I think everybody got just a little overwhelmed <laughs> with that or underwhelmed with it yeah. maybe because everybody was doing it good bad and mine always sounded okay it just never sounded as good as i wanted it to the quality just wasn't great i ordered gear we brought in microphone we did all kinds of stuff and it still just sounded okay you know yeah. so i kind of put the brakes on that but this new project and all these little things that we have recorded like you said we can still find ways to get the message across and the music out and what i'm doing for those who are interested yeah well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, with us and our viewers oh. now and listeners. That's yeah, great. <laughs> well, thanks, Judy. I've really enjoyed it, and I look forward to getting with you again. Maybe to be a